Well, as you will recall from our last class, uh, we've been discussing Sigmund Freud. Now, the, the reason why we're spending some time on him in a course like this is because it, he had such a profound impact on how the field of clinical psychology developed. And while he is now a, a, certainly a minor character uh, in the field, you'll see as we, we talk today about how uh, we first began to look at psychopathology and how we first began to, to look at psychological intervention, kind of the first meaningful form of uh, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis. You know, Freud was the founder of all these things. And some of the insights he had are very legitimate insights today. But certainly the theory itself, uh, you know, no one adheres to anymore. Now just to review for you though, you will recall that you know, you know, his was an instinctual theory. That is, he believed that right from birth, you were driven by these very basic urges that were controlled by what he called the pleasure principle to seek gratification. And that actually, if, if every child were allowed to grow into adulthood and to do what their instincts told them, then they would simply become uh, hedonistic. They would simply do whatever made them feel good. Uh, and it wouldn't matter uh, you know, what anyone else thought, because the only person in the world was the individual. Now he made, he came up with that theory, you know, starting out with the idea that if you look at newborns, newborns don't even know there's a world. I mean, newborns have been, you know, very comfortably in mom's womb. They come out of mom's womb. They, they don't know that difference yet. And, uh, and so everything that the infant does is to seek gratification for him or herself. Now he saw that as, as what people really are like. But as one's life develops, one finds out that there are more complications. So let me uh, take us back here. If you remember, the, in the psyche, we said there were three parts of it. And we said, you know, there's a, there's a small part of your psyche that's conscious, and that really refers to what you're thinking about now. And there's a part that's pre-conscious, and that refers to what you can recall. Uh, material that you're not thinking about because you have no reason to think about it now, but you could actually bring it up if you needed to. And then there was this huge area of this iceberg called the unconscious. And that's where all of this, you know, primitive life was stored. That's where all these urges existed. And Freud felt that, uh, indeed, if you could just be who you are, you would be your unconscious. Uh, but of course, society doesn't allow that. So what he did was to develop a psychic structure and to say, this, this unconscious world you have, we, we call the id. And it's the source of all these basic instincts that are striving for gratification. And, uh, and what happens is you can't just let all those instincts run wild uh, in the social environment you're in. So you have mechanisms that help you to adjust. Now one he called the superego. And the purpose of the superego was to give you some social control that is, so that the behavior that you would engage in would not cause you problems in the interpersonal world in which you lived. And if you remember, the superego was mostly uh, came from the way in which parents and loved ones early in your life interpreted the world to you. So when, you know, your mother, your grandfather, uh, if you had babysitters, etc., and they told you that certain things are good, and when you did them, they smiled, uh, then you knew th those behaviors are fine. If on the other hand, uh, you did other behaviors, and they told you these things are bad, then you began to realize, I can't do those things, or people will get angry with me, people will get upset with me, so there are some urges I can't give uh, control, I can't give vent to. Then Freud said, you know, there is this very important part of you that we'll call the ego. And the ego, of course, it's many cases been identified with you. It is 
who you are in the sense of it is who you consciously think you are. And the ego is that mechanism that allows you to reflect, to make decisions, uh, to assess what you want to do, to assess what's safe, what's not safe. And the difference, or at least one difference, between the ego and the superego is much of the superego you do unconsciously. That is, you just avoid certain things because you already have enough fears that if you did those things, you would be harmed. Or you may conform and do certain things uh, without thinking much about it because you already know those things are highly desired by loved ones. The ego is a mechanism that allows you to reflect and to think about you know, things that uh, you might want to try and how safe is it to try it? Uh, will this be good for you? Will you be gratified if you do this? Will you be harmed if you do this? And, uh, and, and so those things uh, become the, you know, what takes up most of your life. And you, you will find as we're going to move on, uh, later on I'll talk a little bit about ego psychology because that really becomes the field. That is, later on, and we'll talk about Eric Erickson, who's a very good example, uh, people will say the ego has its own energy. Now, right now, Freud is saying, no, all the energy comes out of the id. And all these other mechanisms are simply to give you ways to deal with all these primitive impulses. Now also I mentioned uh, you know, uh, ego defense mechanisms. And, and I said you know, the ego defense mechanisms were seen as coming from early traumatic experiences. That is if a lot of anxiety was raised somewhere early, you repressed that, uh, that experience. But you, you had to find some ways uh, to let the energy out, like what Freud would say is, you know, your it is seeking gratification, but uh, you can't just allow it to, to come forward the way uh, the pleasure principle would suggest. So you, you push it back, but still it's going to find expression somewhere. So you have to find a safe way. And I was thinking of uh, one defense mechanism I didn't mention yesterday, but there's one called intellectualization. Uh, it, it's a marvelous one in the sense that what intellectualization does is to allow somebody to get out uh, you know, their, their psychic uh, energy in a very safe way. And I remember one, this probably won't be very relevant to you, but when I was an undergrad or a graduate student, I can't remember, a, a movie called Tom Jones came out. Now back in those days, you know, you didn't have the kind of porno movies that we have today where there's no subtlety. I mean, someone just runs out, rips off their clothes, and you know, this is a sex scene. And most movies have to have a sex scene these days, so you know it's coming. But back in those days, you couldn't, you couldn't have movies like that. So this Tom Jones comes out, and there's a scene in it in which this man and woman are eating. And, and they, and they're, it, it's a it, this very intense scene where they're, they're gnawing on uh, their, uh, this, uh, this turkey, I think it is, or chicken, I forget, something like that. And as you're watching it, you realize that, and they're looking at each other, and the more they eat this food, the more you can see they're getting sexually aroused. And so as the scene goes on, it becomes more and more erotic. And everybody in the theater, I mean, is really turned on by this. And because in, in those days, you didn't get movies like this. Anyway, I remember being back in the, in the university cafeteria, and I had seen the movie, and a group of us at the table, and, uh, and someone brings up the movie. And immediately, everybody's first thought, you know, is this scene? And people start laughing. And before anyone can say something like, God, was that ever sexy? One of the women at the table says, oh, he has a great movie. Wasn't the cinematography wonderful? <laughs> everybody looks at the cinematography of all the things that was in that scene. Who would think about cinematography? And that's what intellectualization is. You know, you take something that, let's say, is highly erotic, highly primitively driven, and you turn it into some abstract concept. And the issue, obviously, with this young woman was she didn't want to talk about how, how sexual, how intense uh, this was. And so 
She changed, I mean, the, everybody at the table picked this up. I mean, this was one of those defense mechanisms where the, the young woman didn't know what she was doing, but everybody else at the table realized, boy, this is someone who doesn't want to talk about a neurotic scene. That's what a defense mechanism, mechanism is. And as you can see, not only does this allow this woman not to talk about the eroticism that was there, but she also gets control of the conversation. So she keeps the focus on something that is very safe for her. And therefore, the topic that would be very difficult for her to talk about doesn't come up. That's what defense mechanisms are like. And remember, too, that I pointed out to you that the first thing that happens is you repress the impulse that's trying to express itself because that's unacceptable. So repression is a part of every defense mechanism. It's the first step. You push this energy back, then the energy finds some other way to express itself. And the way in which it expresses itself is how we give names to these defense mechanisms. Now, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about let me, psychoanalysis. And, and just before we do that, uh, because at the end of our last discussion, I said I would mention some character types. One of the things that flows out of the of psychoanalytic theory is that you can view certain life adjustments as being related to how people did or did not uh, resolve conflicts at a certain stage. So, for example, we have what we call the oral receptive character. And this develops as a result of overindulgence in the oral stage. That is, too much gratification happened there. So the individual who meets this description is excessively dependent on other people for gratification. That's why we call this person the oral receptive character. They need other people to provide gratification and take care of them. Now, there's some subtlety to the way this shows up. Uh, for example, an oral receptive character may be a very nice person. A person who often compliments you, tells you you look very good today, uh, tells you you're charming, you're fun to be with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but the important thing is they're doing that not because they are really trying to make you feel good. That would be a very adult thing to, to say to someone, gee, you look good, or you've really you know, been sharp lately, or whatever. But their motivation is they want you to be good to them, to like them. Uh, the whole reason for complimenting other people is not to make other people feel good. It's to gain a certain kind of social control that causes the other person to want to be good to you. Now, when you think about this, the first thing you'll, you'll begin to realize is, well, this is pretty superficial. And that's exactly the way it is. These people are superficial. This is not someone, for example, who wants you to try to get involved with them. So this is often, you know, kind of a person who has a lot of friends, but no best friend, no intimacy, uh, no one who's going to get terribly close to this person, but also, no one is actually going to, uh, you know, to offend this person because the person's nice. <clears throat> and if you're a nice person, people will be nice to you. But in order to feel safe, this person's got to have some real distance. And, and so that's the key. To, and that's why we say this person is, is orally fixated, meaning this is a very early stage problem that this person can't get past uh, the need for just constant gratification. Now, there's also a character that we call the oral aggressive character. This is an individual who feels that other people will not be gratifying. And so they, they develop a, a, a manipulative, uh, sometimes a hostile manner towards other people. And it, it's a mechanism that kind of tries to force others to be good. And the sad thing with this person is that this individual actually believes that other people will only be good to them if they're frightened of them. So they, they do a lot of things that are hostile. Remember, 
I talked about this in, in another context when we were talking about the anal stage and people being kind of anal expulsive. Well, this character, which is kind of, it comes from that, is someone who knows that you can gain a lot of control uh, by simply being hostile with other people because they will want to avoid your hostility and therefore they will be very nice to you. The problem of, and, and so this is a person, for example, I mentioned to you know, who, who might be criticizing a lot. Well, if you're sharp, you figure out what it is that this person is always criticizing. You avoid all those things. And so you may find that this individual, who you don't really don't want to be around, but when you are around this individual, and maybe because you have to work with them, uh, but you're very careful and you behave in a certain way. And you behave in a way that will keep this person from being hostile towards you. Now, if you think about it, you know, that's a lot of control to have, that people actually won't do certain things or say certain things, uh, and that means that this kind of character has far more control uh, socially than you would think, certainly than they deserve. But the important thing with this person is it never goes any further than that. That is, while you avoid uh, perhaps the things that this person would get angry with, you never try to get close to this person. And that's important to the person because this person totally cannot deal with intimacy. So they want to avoid ever letting that happen. Now then, there's also, and you can see how these are stage related, there's also in the phallic stage, there's the phallic character. Now this is a person who is excessively fond uh, of their body, perhaps even of their, their sexual organs. Uh, the real stereotype, of course, is, you know, the individual who's out on the beach, uh, really showing their body. And by the way, that's, the person doesn't have to have a great body. They just have to believe they have one. And you can make a real <laughs> distinction there. But the message is, look at me. Look at how wonderful I look. Certainly, you should adore me. Uh, you know, you should pay particular attention to me. You should like to look at me. Don't touch, but you can look. Uh, and what happens is that these are individuals who develop very superficial relationships. Because what happens is, you know, you, you see someone like this, and let's say they are very attractive. And so, you know, you want to seek to be close to them. And so what happens early, of course, is you compliment them. You say, gee, you know, you're a very attractive person. I'd like to get to know you. Uh, I think maybe uh, you would be very interesting. Well, it doesn't take long for you to find out that this person is not terribly interesting because their big motive is for you to spend all your time being good to them. That is, telling them they're terrific, telling them they're beautiful, telling them they're nice. Uh, and you begin to notice that, you know, this person doesn't give much. Uh, this person is so in love with himself or herself that they don't seem to have much energy or time to, to be uh, nice to me. And so what happens is, uh, you know, you eventually lose interest. And, and once you lose interest, uh, this person drops you very quickly because they're often socially adept enough to get other people who are interested in them. And this is the, the kind of individual who actually makes a lot of contacts with people. That is, people are attracted to the person, uh, but the relationships end. Miss Lee? This is phallic character, and it comes, you know, uh, as a result of being, not resolving the phallic stage, so that you stay really interested in all these, you know, very primitive kind of gratification, and you don't get to the next stage where you realize that, you know, you need to share some of this uh, with other people. Now then, there are a couple of concepts that uh, I want to be sure that you recall. One is fixation. And what Freud posited is that occasionally people can't resolve the conflicts that come in a certain stage. And so they stay there. Like phallic character is an example. Phallic character means a person kind of fixated in the phallic stage. Now, and by the way, this is a very important concept uh, that comes up in terms of psychopathology and abnormal behavior. Uh, for a long time, many of the concepts in psychopathology, many of the ways we diagnosed people, 
were determined by the belief that people had fixated at certain stages and we could identify uh, their conflict with uh, unresolved uh, issues in these stages. Now, what happens then with fixation is the person is not having resolved the stage, is devoting all of their energy to conflicts that came up in that stage. And, and Freud's thesis was, if that's happening, since you have a finite amount of energy, you don't have any energy to give to the next stage. So you, you can't move on developmentally. And so if an individual, for instance, was uh, fixated in the oral stage, then they, they remain infantile and, and unproductive throughout their life. Uh, and, you know, there are stereotypes, and sometimes stereotypes are helpful, like, you know, the person who is eating all of the time. Now, there are all kinds of reasons for why people eat, and, and certainly uh, it's not necessarily the case that somebody is fixated in the oral stage. But for those that are, what it means is the person is constantly eating because they still associate gratification and safety with those nice feelings that they get uh, when they eat. And, and, it, it, and also, they avoid other kinds of conflicts. For example, we know that in some cases, if people get terribly overweight, then they, they become not desirable to other people. So that it's not likely you'll seek an intimate relationship with someone who is terribly overweight. Well, that's great for that person because there's no way in the world they're ready to deal with issues in the genital stage or to deal with issues of intimacy. Uh, that's far beyond them. So they actually have a positive reason to stay overweight. And sometimes when these people come into psychotherapy, if you don't recognize that, you know, and they want, they come to a weight control program, and the first thing is everybody gets all energized and want to help the person to lose weight. If you don't know the dynamics of why this person has been overweight for so long, uh, you, you lose them. They drop out very quickly. They don't, they're not ready to lose weight. The first thing they got to do is to get in touch with all of these frightening feelings they have about what it would be like if they couldn't eat all the time and they had to, to go through the anxiety of like not eating and getting that gratification. And worse, if they lost this weight and they became an attractive person, people might want to have other levels of relationships with them, like they might want to become intimate and the person is not ready. So often it's only after those issues get resolved that somebody is really able to lose weight. And I, I can tell you from doing therapy with, with people like this, sometimes it takes a long time for the person to, to come to grips with a lot of the intimacy issues and the fears uh, before they can lose weight. But I've seen people, once they get to that stage and once they get feeling safe enough, and I've seen people lose 150, 170 pounds uh, and, uh, and develop their very first intimate relationship and get married and do well. Uh, so. Having these kind of problems doesn't mean you can't overcome them, but in all likelihood, you won't overcome them without intensive psychotherapy. Now, a second important term is regression. And regression really is used to denote individuals who have at least partially resolved the developmental stage, and they've progressed to the next stage. The problem that happens is that there are some issues that come about in the next stage that are very frightening to them. And they're not coping very well. And, and Freud's theory of neurosis is very dependent on this concept because what he said was, if you get very frightened in, in a, a later stage and you experience a lot of anxiety, what you do is you revert back to the behavior of the previous stage because in the previous stage, you felt calm. You felt much safer. And so by feeling safer, uh, behaving at a you know, less mature level, uh, you, know, you don't have all of this tension. Now, of course, the, the real uh, extreme example of this, and, and certainly you see this still today in psychiatric hospitals, but you used to see a lot more of it when we didn't have the, the good drugs we have today. Uh, you would see patients lying on the floor, in, uh, psychotic patients, in a fetal position. And 
you know, and the idea was that somebody had to get to that primitive a level, that is, being like they were in mom's womb before they felt safe. And, uh, and you would see this with people who were, were, were very psychotic, that they would just lie there for hours in that kind of fetal position. And, and if you tried to, to change them, just you know, walk up and talk to them and that, they would get very frightened. Sometimes they might even get hostile with you. Uh, and in some cases, they wouldn't move. I mean, in some cases, you could not even make contact with them. They had regressed so far that this world out here didn't even exist. So that's a concept of regression. You, you have reached some stage, you get terribly anxious in that stage, you begin regressing back to find some more comfortable level of adjustment. Now there are other, you know, less pathological forms of regression. Uh, consuming alcohol, uh, smoking a cigarette every time you get anxious. And, and you have to make distinctions between um, why you, you, know, you get involved in a behavior. For example, let's say you, you come home in the evening and you pour yourself a glass of wine and you relax and you feel good. That's not regressive. That's not pathological. You already know from experience that uh, if you have that glass of wine, you feel good, uh, that uh, you know, you're not gonna be intoxicated, but you're, you're gonna feel the way you'd like to feel, you're relaxed, uh, that's fine. When we talk about regression, we're talking more about the person who's about to go out with a new date. And they're so anxious about it, they drink two or three martinis at home before they go out. That is, they have to get intoxicated and they have to have this kind of oral gratification to feel safe enough to go out. Now, that's pathological. And that's what we mean when we're talking about uh, regression. And so you can't just take a behavior like having a drink or having a cigarette and say, well, that's pathological. What becomes pathological is, is when there's a certain extreme quality to it, you're driven to do it. And it's a mechanism to help you to either control or avoid anxiety that you would be very comfortable with. Now that brings us to psychoanalysis and psychoanalysis uh, as a treatment. Now, when, when Freud started, uh, psychoanalysis uh, was a very rigid treatment. Uh, it started with him uh, in having people lie down on a couch. And basically, the, uh, the, or the way in which someone kind of discovered what was going on in their unconscious was that they free associated. And this theory developed from the work that Freud had done in hypnosis. What, what he recognized was that you could talk to someone and ask them about their early history, and they couldn't remember their early history. Or they couldn't remember especially things that were conflictual earlier in their life. But with some of these people, if you put them in a trance, they would do amazingly well at recalling all kinds of, uh, of events. And so he began thinking, well, there must be some way to reach this world. It's clear the world is there because in, for some people in a trance situation, they will recall things that they would not recall in any other situation. So what he did is to have people free associate with the idea that if you got them to simply talk about emotionally troubling areas of their life, that the more they associated, the more you, the therapist, would begin to, to be able to pick up themes. And, and this really was the, the nature of what therapy was about. It was about uh, the therapist listening very carefully to the patient and the patient giving enough information that the, the therapist would be able to kind of recognize, like, what are the themes that keep coming up that this person can't cope with? Now, he saw that the, the, the way in which people would relate their problems is usually being a metaphor. So the person wouldn't tell you exactly what had happened, but they would, uh, they would give you clues. 
Now, one of the ones that came up that uh, came out a lot in early literature was the example of a woman who had been raped at a very early age. And uh, as a young child, and of course this event was so traumatic that she just totally repressed it. And, and for many years it doesn't become an issue for her. Uh, but as she gets older, and, uh, and she begins to have opportunities to get involved in romantic relationships, and she wants to be romantic, she begins to become very anxious. And specifically, she finds that the anxiety becomes intense and even overwhelming when she's getting to that stage in a relationship where it might turn sexual. And, and she doesn't really understand. At first, what happens is she just deals with it by saying, well, it's, it's the problem of these men. I mean, they want to be sexual, I don't want to be sexual. So I'll blow this guy off and that guy off. But then later, uh, you know, the woman begins to realize there must be something wrong here because actually, I would like to be, I've lost a couple of very, very nice people. And I don't want these relationships to keep ending, but also I'm recognizing I am terribly frightened of the idea of being sexual. So she enters therapy. Now, during the course of free association, you might find that uh, this woman would associate when you ask her, you know, what she thinks about when she thinks about sexual acts. Uh, she often might think about very destructive things. So you might get a lot of destructive images. Or she might tell you about a dream she had where like a huge truck crashed into a house, crashed into her house perhaps. Uh, or she might talk about experiences uh, of being trapped uh, like under a huge beam. And as the therapist is listening, the therapist is, is seeing this metaphor. I mean, obviously they're very sexual objects, a huge truck being trapped under a beam, that, you know, the images are very scary and that this woman is very frightened. And then the person might even have associations to things like uh, feeling like she has no arms, meaning that, that she's helpless that if she were to be sexual, she would give up all of her freedom. And so what happens is, as, as all of these things surface, the analyst becomes aware of there's tremendous anxiety in this person associated with sexual intercourse. And, and so what you try to do is to help the patient to keep talking about it and to recognize that when they talk about it, uh, now that you know what it is, is the source of the anxiety, that they get to be very anxious. Now, when this first occurs, almost always the patient will refuse to go very far with this. That is, the anxiety becomes so scary that the person resists. And the first form of resistance usually is the person when you say, well, what do you think about when you think about intercourse? They say, I don't think about anything. Uh, I mean, I'm, I don't know why we're talking about this. I mean, you know, if you're the one who wants to talk about it. I mean, I didn't bring this up. And, and for a while, you, you get a period of resistance because it's just too scary. And you have to be, you know, really allow that person to be scared. But eventually, they keep coming back to it. And then they begin to talk about uh, the fact that when the subject comes up, they really do get anxious. And, and what happens in, in, uh, in a case like this particular case, the person eventually recalls the traumatic event. And recalling the traumatic event uh, and disclosing it, this, this horrible thing, something that this person has never wanted to acknowledge, uh, she is able to, to realize that she's doing it and, and it's safe. Like the, the therapist is not getting upset. Uh, the fact the therapist is being, being very empathic with her, is very concerned about her. And once the events have really been disclosed and shared with another person, what the theory uh, holds is that the anxiety then will dissipate. And the person will not have to, to worry about that again. Now, I might mention that such things really do occur. That is, there's no question that there are uh, young women uh, as well as young men. But uh, the stereotype is more been women who really have been raped early in their life. In some cases by their father or relative, sometimes by a stranger and that those experiences are terribly traumatic. Now, it's also been found, though, that people who get too tied up in this theory, when 
when someone is having some difficulty with intimacy, there have been therapists who keep pushing them to try to recall things in their life that didn't happen. And we've had a person, in fact, a group of people develop research on what are called false memories, where it isn't that the patient comes up with this memory, like I just described, where you let the person talk and they actually you know, come up with the memory, but the therapist kind of pushes the person towards having such a memory, and the, the patient, being so dependent on the therapist, actually begins to believe that something like this occurred. And so, you know, they begin to, uh, you know, to associate that this is why I have a problem. This is not the real reason they have a problem. They weren't raped when they were young. And if it weren't for this therapist, you know, kind of planting those ideas and kind of aggressively forcing that, the person would never have come to that conclusion. And, and that's really uh, been sad that we've had therapists so poorly trained that they can't make the distinction between allowing a person to discover the real reason for why they have an enormous amount of anxiety. And, and instead, you have someone pushing a theory saying that, well, it, this must have happened because you have the same kind of symptoms as other people who had this happen. Uh, that, that's gotten a lot of attention. Now, I'm going to skip dreams because uh, we may get to it later, but uh, the one thing I would tell you was that for Freud, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about his focus on dreams. Freud believed that dreams were, in many ways, the same way as free association. In fact, what Freud did is when someone told him a dream, he would simply have the person free associate to it. So, you know, someone comes in and says, you know, I, I dreamt last night that I went uh, on a long trip. And he'd say, well, you know, tell me what you, kind of things you think about when you think about a long trip. I mean, so, whereas if someone had come in uh, and started the session off by saying, you know, I, I've just come back from a long trip. He'd say, well, tell me about what you think about when you have a long trip. So he treated the dream material very similarly to the way he would treat it, real material. What he wanted to do is to use it to, uh, to get to unconscious material. But the thesis he had was that in dreams, many times you express emotions that you wouldn't express consciously. In fact, he even said that dreams were the royal road to the unconscious. That is, that material that you might not be willing to discuss normally will come up in some images and dreams. And so it, it may be a faster way to learn about someone's unconscious uh, is to let them reassociate to their dreams. Now, th the process that was developed for psychoanalytic treatment uh, was really quite complex. And, and, and person goes through a number of stages uh, before treatment usually is successful. Now, one concept that you need to understand that was paramount in psychoanalysis is a concept called transference. Transference meant that the patient begins to, to transfer feelings that they have and experiences that they have had and worries and conflicts onto the therapist. Now remember in Freud's time, the therapist actually sat behind the patient. The patient was lying down on a couch and here's the person's head and here's the therapist sitting behind them. The patient can't even see the therapist. Uh, very different than the way you'll see all the other therapies de develop where it's much more face to face. But, and and the, Freud's idea was you just let the person uh, go on and the person will eventually make you the therapist into a number of people, some of whom will be the conflictual people in their life. So at the beginning of treatment, the experience uh, that took place, especially if this was going to work, was something called positive transference. And positive transference meant the, meant the person starts off having these fantasies that you, the therapist, are wonderful. You are going to solve all of his or her problems. Uh, you are going to, to be nurturant, caring, loving, insightful. Uh, by seeing you, this person is going to feel a lot better. And so they start through a period where uh, you begin to see as the therapist, like what are all the things that this person is desirous of? But you don't know like why they can't do it for themselves. And as you sit and you listen to these associations, after a while, the patient finds you're not doing enough 
I mean, you're not doing what I thought you would do. I'm not cured. Uh, I haven't had the kind of relief outside these sessions from anxiety I thought I would have. And so, and also, I'm beginning to question all these things I'm disclosing to you. It might be scary to disclose so much stuff. So you get a period that's referred to as negative transference. And in negative transference, the, the patient is trying to avoid coming to grips with some of the primitive feelings that they're thinking they might be able, <coughs> excuse me, they might be able to trust the therapist with. Uh, but it's, it's just too scary. And so what happens uh, is the, the, the patient uh, feels that if they go any further, the therapist will reject them. And that the analyst will, will fail to love them. So they become critical of the analyst. Uh, they may even become rejecting and scornful so that uh, they're testing the analyst. You know, saying things like, you know, you don't do anything for me. In fact, you know, I, my, my cousin is seeing a therapist and, and she seems to be a lot sharper than you are. And, uh, and she's getting better and I'm not. And, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure why I'm coming here. And, uh, and I noticed lately, uh, and here's the patient talking, says to the analyst, you know, I noticed lately you don't dress very well. Uh, and uh, this office is beginning to look deteriorated and all kinds of things like that. Now, the, the whole psychodynamic behind this is that the patient is testing, I mean, how hostile can I be with this analyst uh, without losing his or her love? That is, how free can I be with a lot of the unpleasant things that are inside me and still be able to relate to this person. So it becomes tremendously important for the uh, therapist to allow such behaviors to go on and, and not to respond to it in any way except to be very accepting of it. Now, once the patient gets through this stage and the person begins to feel safe, then often this leads them to really explore a much deeper level of their psyche than they had been exploring. Uh, this is when they may really talk about some very primitive anger or rage that they feel. And they may talk about a lot of dependency feelings or sexual feelings. And, and often at this stage, you know, the person is more able to talk about things like their need for nurturance or their sexual activities. Uh, or, or perhaps uh, their anger at a very specific person who has harmed them, or uh, that they, they have felt neglected, or that they, that they feel lonely so much of the time, uh, or that they have intense uh, periods where they, they really want to eat or drink, and, uh, or they, they talk about uh, things they want to seek, gratifications they want to seek that they, they feel are embarrassing. So the person begins talking at a much deeper level because they feel safe. They feel this is, therapist is not going to get angry. Uh, they feel they're not going to get rejected. And it's time to reveal to somebody uh, all these terrible fears that I have. Now, many of these uh, actually may have been discussed earlier in therapy. But usually they're done in a far more defensive way and the person isn't trusting yet enough to disclose to the therapist many of the elements uh, of, the, of the fears that the person has. So it's at this stage that therapy becomes much deeper. And, and here also is, 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 you know, a classic example, for example, is when, when the patient brings up something like a difficulty with masturbating. And it's often a topic that's it's hard for people to talk about. Well, when you listen, you know, and you ask the person, you know, why, why would you have this difficulty? It's not uncommon for people to associate that they, they were discovered masturbating by a parent or by some person when they were very small. Uh, and in fact, if it goes way back, and maybe they're just playing with their genitals, but someone was very harsh with them. Someone made them feel this is a terrible act. And so they, they just feel guilty uh, whenever they have any kind of impulses like this. And 
once a person is able to, to recognize like why it is they're doing it, and actually they're responding to somebody 20, 30 years ago in their life, uh, may have even you know, been uh, a babysitter whom they haven't seen in 25 years, but suddenly it dawns on them what it is that they feel so guilty about, they feel so sh ashamed about, because they feel that they are a bad person if they do this, and they will be punished. Uh, once they get that insight, then people usually have the freedom to do it or not do it. Now you also can take the case, you know, you, you find that in, in some men have a lot of difficulty with anger. And, and certainly in, in one classic case, uh, and certainly this happened more than once, but a, a man describes the fact that he just can't get angry. And he describes, he knows he's angry, but I mean he can't let any anger out. And as you explore his history, you find out that actually his father beat his mother. And when he was a little kid, he witnessed the father beating up the mother. And he begins to recall he felt enraged with his father. He wanted to kill his father. And, but he realized like he wasn't strong enough to do it, that, it, that if he actually started fighting with his father, he would get beat up just like his mother. So his resolution, as a little tot, is to repress all this. And only later, in free association, after a long time, do these images start coming back that, you know, and, and, and the memories that, you know, my father did beat my mother, and, and that, that frightened me. I, I was really scared, and I, I know I hated my father. Once the person begins to realize that their association with anger is not like most of us. I mean, I'm angry because somebody didn't do something I wanted them to do, or I'm angry because somebody disappointed me. This guy's association is, when I'm angry, I want to kill. Therefore, I can't let anger out. And once the person realizes that that's what this is all about, that it's all about this unresolved feeling towards dad, uh, then the person usually is able to be more appropriate to admit, yeah, I was angry when so-and-so showed up a half hour late, and yeah, I was angry when I didn't get a raise, and I was angry. That, and and, and the, the person has really changed. I mean, the person realizes anger is okay. Uh, anger doesn't mean killing, and anger doesn't mean killing my father, which uh, was terribly frightening because I thought if I ever really got angry, not only would I not kill my father, perhaps, but he would kill me. Those things often, uh, in, in, in people who have had very traumatic experiences, do come up. And, and it can be very helpful. Now there are other ways, by the way, to help people deal with their anger, but, but this is how it was dealt with in psychoanalysis. Okay, there are a few other concepts I want to be sure that uh, you, know, you become familiar with. One is that all this process we're talking about in psychoanalysis we call it working through. That is, as the person starts off and they're free associating and they're presenting their problems and they're resisting therapy and they're getting negative transferences taking place and uh, all of this is part of what's called working through. That is, you have to go through certain stages in order to get to where you, you want to get. Then there's a concept called catharsis. And Catharsis refers to, in fact, we have the slide on, uh, thank you. Uh, catharsis refers to the experience you have when a whole lot of psychic energy is able to express itself because it's no longer unsafe. So for example, our young man who can now get angry uh, suddenly has this unbelievable relief that, my God, that's what it was about. I was so angry with that father of mine. Uh, that's why I'm so rigid, and that's why I'm, I, I, I don't express my anger. And then the person is able to, to be angry, and that experience we tend to think of as a cathartic experience. And it's an important part of therapy, that is, certain catharsis that take place allow the unleashing of feeling and allow a person to both have insight and to feel more comfortable. Now there was another uh, concept that, uh, that Freud had called parapraxis. Parapraxis, uh, another term, is slips of the tongue. 
And Freud, uh, you know, made the observation that things don't happen accidentally. That uh, when you say something that seems to be incorrect, often it, it's really a wish or an expression of conflict. So that, for example, uh, if today is Thursday, but um, you know you find yourself saying, "Ha, ah, great, it's Friday." Uh, it's, there's more to it than you've identified Thursday as Friday. It's more like you wish this were Friday. You're getting fed up with this week. You'd like this week to be over. It would be nice if it were Friday, because then I wouldn't have to deal with my job or my class or whatever. And so what Freud said was that when people make slips of the tongue, uh, these things can be, be very meaningful. Now some are innocent enough, and they really don't matter. I mean, if, if, you, uh, if you think tomorrow is, or you think today is tomorrow, so. But what you need to recognize is the, the tendency is to think that it was an accident that you named the wrong day. Freud would say it wasn't an accident. Actually, you really wish it was Friday. Now, there are other slips of the tongue that are more problematic. Uh, one most often cited, you know, is when uh, one lover uh, calls the other lover by the wrong name. This can have consequences. <laughs> And, you know, in fact, uh, there are a lot of comedies been built on this, you know, where uh, to, uh, you know, and people laugh at it. But the truth is, uh, this does happen, and often it is an unconscious expression that actually, it is not you I want to be sexual with. I really want to be sexual with so-and-so, who won't have me, by the way, so here I am being sexual with you. And there have been any number of relationships that people have had that have been blown because of this. Where someone discovers that, you know, I felt this person has been somewhat distant and I've been trying to be very appealing and very involved. And, and now I realize why I feel I'm not being successful is this person is not really here. Well, in, if, if you think about it, and you can probably think in your own life, places where uh, you've made slips of the tongue. I mean, everybody makes them. It's a very common kind of thing. But before Freud, people thought slips of the tongue were simply, you know, you made a mistake. Once Freud came along, he said, you didn't make a mistake. Uh, you know, this is your unconscious telling you something. Uh, and this is its form of expression. Now, there's another concept uh, that's important in psychoanalysis, important in all kinds of psychotherapy, and it's called countertransference. Countertransference means or refers to the feelings that the therapist has. And one of the very uh, key things in, in, uh, in countertransference is that if the therapist recognizes that he or she has feelings for the patient, that's fine. That's not countertransference. Countertransference is when the therapist doesn't realize they have feelings or that they're beginning to, uh, to deal with the patient uh, as if the patient was someone other than that person is. That is, the therapist is beginning to seek gratification for the therapist's impulses through the patient so that the therapist, for instance, may want to direct the patient to talk about certain things because the therapist likes hearing about it, not that the patient really needs to talk about that area. Well, we're, we're coming to the end of, of this uh, session. I'll give you a couple of examples when we start the next session, and then we'll be moving on to talk about uh, another very interesting person. But uh, we'll take a break for now.